Well, it's time to predict the lines on the Our Lads Football Network, Our Lads Football YouTube channel. I'm Greg De Palma, and this is the show where each week we're going to predict the lines for college football and the NFL, and then we're actually going to do some projecting down the line to let you know what we think about as far as the lines changing from the day that we record this show, which is going to be on Tuesday evenings, till game time, anywhere from Thursday through Monday night. And to join me each week is going to be <clears throat> our resident lines expert here on the Our Lads Football Network, Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com. How's it going, Andy? It's going uh, wonderfully. I don't know that I would use the word expert unless you put it in quotes with a little smiley sign, but uh, it's well, a good you're exercise. Not an expert, I'm not sure who is then, Andy. Well, the lines makers are. They're the ones who do. Uh, and I guess the betters have to determine, you know, how good those lines are. But I guess what we, uh, when we're predicting the lines, these are actually after the fact because these lines have been out as we're doing this a couple of days. So, for example, on Sunday night. Well, we're not predicting uh, the lines live on the show. Right. But we we're, we're, uh, we are we did predict the them lines before. before we see yeah. the lines. Exactly. Before I look at them. Correct. Yep. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So obviously it's the honor system because if we didn't have the honor system for this show, it would be useless. And why would we do it? So, yeah. um, you know what I was going to say, Greg, just for a moment, maybe sure. we should both give our philosophies on what factors uh, we or what's our philo yeah our philosophy with predicting the line in other words are you basing it on power ratings are you basing it on perception are you basing it perhaps on at what line would you find it difficult to make a play on either side well before we do that since this is the very first time that you've joined us here on the our lads football network i want to introduce you to our audience because again you're going to be with me all season we'll also uh have you on on different shows on the network but we know each other from Playbook Experts YouTube channel. That's the show, uh, the uh, Playbook uh, Against the Spread podcast. Uh, that is available every Wednesday to Thursday when it's posted. We record it every Wednesday with Mark Lawrence, who owns uh, the PlaybookSports.com site. And I've also, of course, talked a, a lot about Mark. We uh, do a show together every Thursday, as uh, you know now, on the channel where we take a look at the lines each week and give our picks on the games in NFL and college football. And this is the magazine 32nd year that Mark Lawrence has published this magazine. And so um, that's uh, where Andy and I know each other. I produced the show for Mark on that channel. There you go. See, like, uh, we don't go anywhere without it. Never leaves and, my side. All right. And so uh, to go back to your original question, uh, how do you prepare? How do you make when, when, when you're going to predict the lines coming up for our show next week? Because this week, um, and again, this goes back to the fact that we weren't able to uh, get started last week, uh, setting up everything. Uh, and I'm fully aware of and Mark, of course, we've talked about how difficult it is to get ready for every football season. And sometimes it takes uh, just a little bit before you can feel like you can breathe. And so that's why we said, we decided, oh, let's just not do it last week. Let's do it this week. But even this week, um, we just figured, you know what? Let, let you start next week on, on joining the predictions. All the numbers we're going to look at this week are going to be my predictions. But next week, we're going to have a combination of yours and mine. So when you start to look over on Sunday at some point, the college football slate, start making your predictions, and then, in, and then into maybe Monday for your NFL, uh, how do you do that? Well, let me say that I will have comments on the games that you've selected because I also made predictions on those games, uh, not with the same in-depth effort that I will be putting in in future weeks as we get more and more uh, into the season, especially in the colleges in, in conference play. Now, there are two things there. Um, the NFL, it's somewhat easier because – uh, two things. Number one, the Westgate for many years has put out advanced lines. So, for example, today being Tuesday, this is the day that they do it. Before week two's games are played, the Westgate ha will have put out, I think by this time already, the advanced bettable line sides and totals for the week three games before any of the week two games are played. OK, but not What's only the reasoning that, for that uh, to attract added action, you know, in advance. And how long so have they people, been doing that for? I'm going to say five or six years. Really? Okay. Yeah. So this and, is and relatively we used to report new. on that on uh, on on Mark's show. I think I think we last year we 
end of doing the uh, the lines on the contest, maybe a separate segments uh, to uh, not take away from the discussion sure. of, of what's really coming up in this week's games. Yep. But the other thing is that the Westgate has done for, I think, three or four years. And I think other places have. I think William Hill did it. Maybe some offshore places, but I don't follow the offshore uh, uh, situation much other than looking at the current lines on the uh, wagering screens as we go into the uh, week's games. But uh, what they've done and what the Westgate has done is actually back in, I think, late July, they put out lines and total for all 18 weeks as a guideline, which I find extremely useful because let's say in the middle of October, there's a game between two teams or who maybe are not performing as well as we thought they, we thought they were. What did the Westgate think those games were going to be priced at before the season started? So that's a little bit of a guide, but more to the point about the week three lines, um, it's a little bit easier for me to make a prediction. I don't look at the reset lines after week two after like week two. So for next week, I will already, well, for, let's say for this week, I already knew what lines the Westgate had up last week, last Tuesday, before this week's games were played. Okay. So I have an idea of what they were thinking. So that for me is almost a starting point. And what happens is after Sunday's games are played before I look at the, because they take the lines down when the games are being played on Sunday. So you could have bet. That's for injuries, next, right? Well, it's for just not, yeah, injuries and how the games are going. For example, I don't know that a lot of people thought Dallas would, uh, you know, lay waste to uh, Cleveland this week, but like while a the major, uh, ma like a major line movement possibility, yeah, yeah, a possible line movement. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing is I, my starting point actually is looking at the lines that were bettable on Saturday, for example, for week two, taking into account what happened in week one, and then my guess or forecast. Okay, when the lines come back up, either late Sunday night or Monday morning, what will the quote unquote new opening line be for week two based upon the results in week one? So I'm basically saying, okay, how much, if any, of a line adjustment do I think will be made between what you could have bet the game on Saturday before Sunday and what you can now, what you could have bet the opening line Sunday night or Monday morning? All right. The other thing is, by the way, just one other thing. There are also, they didn't do it for every college game, but a lot of places has also put out lines back in July and August for selected college games of the year. Some of the big matchups like Tennessee, Oklahoma, Alabama, Georgia, et cetera. And I will use those as a starting point before I look at what the current lines are, because they, those lines will come down probably several weeks before those games are played. So it's a little bit of an idea of where the line is thinking. But for example, if I'm looking at the, uh, uh, let's say uh, this weekend, the Western Kentucky Middle Tennessee State game, I'm just going blind on what I think the opening line might be based upon my knowledge of how these teams have played so far. And those are the kind of games where I could very easily be way off. Oh, by the way, uh, of course, that's another added bonus we all get in Mark's magazine is he has the lines, the advanced lines for all the games. So, Which I think he's taking from the Westgate. There you go. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off uh, again uh, after this week. It's going to be a combination of Andy's uh, picks and my picks. And then we're going to zero in on just some of those games. So we're not going to talk about them all. But this way, you're just going to know exactly how it went for each of us. And as I post these on the screen here, what you're going to see, you're going to see a couple of different categories uh, for each of the NFL and college football. You're going to see uh, the ones that I was uh, right on correct. I made five correct predictions in these games. I was close. And usually I, college, I might go to a point, depending if I don't have enough uh, half a point. But if I have enough half a point close ones like I did, no reason to go to a point. And these are the ones that I was way off on. And then the same thing for the NFL, correct, close, and way off. So uh, let's uh, start, first of all, in college uh, with those correct ones. And um, any of those, give me, get out of those five, uh, which one of those do you agree with the most or you felt that? That was the real. That was the line that you 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 were pretty sure it was going to be pretty much in that number area. Well, I'll, I'll comment a little bit on on each of them. Uh, Colorado, I was a little bit higher than the actual line. I thought they might be nine or ten, considering the fact that last year when they played, and of course they surprised a lot of people with that opening uh, win against TCU. Um, I thought the line might, uh, which was the line was twenty three last year. Uh, and of course, of course, after that quick start, they 
regressed to reality. And last year at plus 23, Colorado State lost by 10. So Colorado State was a nice play. I yeah. thought we might see a line uh, this week, this year that would be a little bit uh, close to double digits, a little bit closer, nine and a half or 10, pretty much like the result from last year. So uh, I'm not sure right now. Well, uh, we'll talk about the game a little bit later as far as where we think the line is going to move. But I thought that, uh, and again, we got to keep in mind, Colorado got Colorado State rather got blown out. What was it, thirty-one nothing, I think, to by Texas in Week One. Well, we've seen what Texas has been able to do in the following game when they went up to Michigan, and in what was thought to be, what was it? Well, it was a good situation for for Michigan, you know, being a home underdog where they very rarely are home underdogs uh, in non-conference play, especially. And te- and Texas was in control from the start of that game, so maybe the Colorado State loss that looked really ugly at the time. You know, we look back uh, six weeks from now, if Texas is like, you know, seven and one, eight and oh or something. And okay. Colorado state is a, is a 500 ball club at that point. When you start conference play, maybe that 31, nothing loss while not looking pretty will be a lot more understandable. And Colorado, we saw last week have some issues with, uh, uh, with uh, Nebraska, but this is a Nebraska team. And I think uh, in our podcast with Mark, uh, we may have mentioned over the summer that, Matt Rule, the current coach of Nebraska, has been very successful at turning programs around, but not in the first year. And this is his second yeah. year at Nebraska. And I think we saw that last uh, Saturday night. Yeah, and it's interesting because, again, the differences between your, your, your taking into account so many different variables that, um, that I don't. I am completely more on sort of like what I do with my college football polls as well. I'm the type of person that's like, I just care about this week, this game, that's it. That's And again, this is just for the lines. And then after I, uh, the lines, then I start to break down things like you talked about. And then, and then I'll go, oh, yeah, you know what? Because matter of fact, we talked, we talked about that, Mark and I, and it was the Marshall-Virginia Tech game. And I was absolutely stunned that the line ended up 20 because I said, well, wait a second. Marshall was a six point favorite last year, favorite, and they won and they out yarded them. And so now Marshall's still considered one of the better teams in the Sun Belt. Yes, we all know Virginia Tech's going to be better, but you're going to change the line by 26 points and they lost to that team last year. And look, if Marshall had any sort of offense at all, that game would have even been closer than 17. But that's doubt. So that's where you would have probably came about thinking of that before you predicted the line, whereas I do it after because I don't have that information or I don't go with that information as part of how I predict the line. So that's why, pro- you know, in a situation like that, I would have I would have had no recollection of uh, or, or had put that into account at all about what happened in last year's game. No, exactly right. And using that as an example, um, Virginia Tech's opening loss at Vanderbilt. Now, Vanderbilt might be improved, but the athletes don't yeah. compare to what Virginia Tech recruits. And the way that game played out with Virginia Tech basically leading wire, I mean, excuse me, Vanderbilt basically leading wire to wire, and then the overtime, and then uh, uh, Vanderbilt winning in the in the overtime, that's inexcusable. And Virginia Tech is not the kind of program that you would feel comfortable laying a huge number if they could manage to lose to Vanderbilt. It's what you know. It's it's one thing for them to uh, uh, to eke out a victory leading ahead, and maybe Vanderbilt comes back and you know makes the makes the score 34-24 at the end of the game. But there are some problems that are there. I mean, you can't take a you can't take any team lightly. But certainly, if you do take a team lightly and you fall behind at halftime. Uh, you usually, if you're a good team or even a better than a good team, you're going to make a, a move in the second half. And yeah, they managed to catch up, but n- they did not impress in the second half of that game when they got that wake up call in the first 30 minutes. And there are a number of games that are like that every week. So I, I, I don't recall what I looked at that game. I could understand reasons for playing Virginia Tech, but in a game that I'll point to, and I think we're going to talk about this team next, Florida State was in a separate, in a similar situation after they go over to Dublin and uh, they lose outright to Georgia Tech. This is a Florida State team that was picked by many to finish first or second in the ACC, along with Miami and Clemson as the leading contenders. And they go over there and they trailed basically uh, throughout that game. It did go to overtime and they lost in overtime. But the fact that they were challenged as much as they were by what I believe 
is a good, very good Georgia Tech team, but not one that should be taking Florida State's talent to the wire. I wanted to see how Florida State would rebound in their next game, that uh, Labor Day night game against Boston College, another team that I expect to show improvement this year. Uh, there were two ways to look at that game. Number one, Boston, I, I was hoping for Florida State to win against Georgia Tech, even if it was ugly, because I wanted to play Boston College in yeah. the Monday night game. But mm -hmm. after Boston College lost, I mean, I'm sorry, after Florida State lost, you had to figure, okay, if you're going to make the playoffs, you cannot lose a second time, especially sort in of a, like what a happened with Clemson on Saturday. A, a, exactly. That's 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 the perfect counterexample. That's what you thought was going to happen. That, that, that's what I thought was going to happen with Florida respond State. That way, yeah. And no, I didn't play the game sure, because intrinsically yeah. I wanted to play Boston College, yeah, of course, yeah. but I thought Florida State, if, if they had anything, see, that's what's going to make this game. And we'll talk about this one because I think it's the next game we have, Florida State hosting Memphis uh, this yeah. week after basically having last Saturday off, you know, what's going to happen in this game. And that's here's a game where I was uh, significantly off in the line, but I'll let you start talking about Florida State. Well, yeah, I mean, I, the reason I had this at seven, and I think a lot of people would at the beginning of the season, I mean, I, I'm just assuming that this line would have been in double digits, might have even been double the point spread if Florida State had opened up 2-0 and oh, like some people be believed. Um, but I'm really impressed with what's going on with Memphis. The problem with Memphis is, and I haven't looked at the, again, I haven't looked at anything yet, but I, I just I do have a, a recollection that once they step up in competition, things get a little bit different with the way that whether you want to say it's the coach or the quarterback, uh, the quarterback's been there forever. The fact is, is when they do step up in competition, um, especially on the road, it's, it's very rare that I that recall Memphis uh, having any or this particular Memphis squad having any of those impact kind of wins. But in saying that, uh, maybe this is a different Memphis team because they've started out really well the first few games. So, but do I think Florida State is going to go zero and three? That is something that I'm not sure I can go with. Um, but the number seven, it's a big fat seven, and I think Memphis is playing good enough football that this could this game could end up uh, being pretty close, which is why I thought seven was a reasonable number. Yeah, I, I look at Memphis, and they opened at home with a game against North Alabama, which is uh, actually a recent addition to the FCS division, much less stepping up to place yeah. an FBS team. And then Troy, which is down apparently significantly, or at least noticeably from the last yep. few years when they were a nice surprise team in their conference. I actually uh, made the line when I opened it. And again, this is not with do it, without doing in-depth research that I do once I know what the line is. I would have made it about 14 which we, so I think you said was double done. where you were yeah. because I still have to make the line based on the talent difference between the teams and that Florida state, they've actually been tested by better teams than uh, Memphis has played, you know, yeah. and, and they were two uh, conf uh, conference games in the ACC, Florida, uh, uh, Boston college and, uh, and, and Georgia tech. And they've had a week off to regroup. Um, remember this is a team and, and, you know, maybe it shows that carryover impact from not having been selected to play in the 14 playoff last year, despite being undefeated and losing out to a one loss Georgia team. Uh, I'm not, and then, of course, being blown out. I'm sorry, losing out to, I think, the Alabama team uh, and then getting blown out by Georgia in their bowl game. What was that, like 65 to three or something like that? And you, it's hard to think that that would have a carryover effect not only into this season, but into the second game after they lost sure. that first conference game on the neutral site. But based on talent, uh, I'm not, you know, having been disappointed in the way Florida State's played the first two weeks, I'm not sure how much confidence I can have in Florida yeah. State, but I do think the week off helps, and I'm more inclined to lay the seven than pass the game right now. And by the way, another uh... – I went into the season. As a matter of fact, Mark and I both picked Memphis uh, to play in the conference championship game. Mark actually had Memphis. Uh, actually, we both had Memphis against South Florida. I took South Florida and Mark took Memphis. So we both like Memphis to uh, maybe finally break through in the AAC. So that's why I had a little bit of respect. And I didn't have respect to Florida State when the season before the season began anyway. I didn't have him in the, in the, in the, SEC, in the ACC championship game. So – there's a little bit of that as well. Is that yeah, but by the way, a lot of people do have Memphis State or Boise State as the group of yeah. five representative in the uh, and so far playoff. Yeah, and 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 by the way, the, the, another by the way is that 
that shows you just like it was for Boise State on Saturday night. Yep. This is going to be a huge game for Memphis. Even if they lose, show up. Make sure yep. that you play this game like it's the because it is. It's 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 their biggest opponent because they're playing a Power Five school. But you know they don't need any extra motivation, but they have it really. So, all right, Kansas. So Kansas and uh, Illinois last week, um, I was a little bit disappointed in what I saw from Kansas, especially Daniels. We, we've talked about Daniels on on the uh, Playbook Expert show. You know, very uh, um, talented kid. Unfortunately, you do wonder whether or not it's going to take him a little time to get going. You know, the injury and all. That back injury, that's a very serious injury that he was dealing with last year. Um, but – UNLV, how can you not be impressed with what's going on with UNLV? Smoked a Houston team that nearly pulled off the upset <laughs> against Oklahoma. And so coming off a, you know, a tremendous season in the Mountain West Championship game and looking the way that they did and the way that Kansas looked, um, that's why I, I kind of felt pretty strong about the number being seven, that Kansas being a Big 12 school, they needed to get uh, that kind of respect. Uh, but UNLV also needed to get respect that I didn't think the line was going to be too much higher than that. I actually made the line 10. Uh, this is a rematch of the bowl game last year. And when you look at last year, I think Kansas was disappointed in its season and the bowl game that they went to, whereas UNLV was elated because they overachieved, I think, more than most people expected last year. Oh, yeah. fact, I, I'm telling people this year who are fans of UNLV, enjoy the team this year under the current coach because if there's a major opening next year, Barry Odom, I think, will be amongst the top of the list as far as the guys to uh, uh, to. Uh, being considered for, you know, like a, a an SEC job if it opens up. Of course, he was already back at Missouri, but there might be other jobs that open up. Uh, I'm thinking Florida, perhaps, if uh, Billy Napier doesn't uh, turn things around this season as well. But uh, they did meet last year in a bowl game, and uh, Kansas, I believe, simply, I think they led that game basically the entire way. I want to say they won like 49-36 or something like that. Uh, I would have liked to have made a case for uh, UNLV in this game. Uh, again, I think... Uh, in fact, I talked about it on the morning show that I did down to uh, Baton Rouge today about uh, uh, that um, uh, UNLV beat Houston, and they beat them defensively. I didn't expect uh, UNLV put, to put 37 points up on the board uh, against Houston. Well, I was surprised they held Houston to seven. I think that was in the final minutes of the game as, as UNLV was pitching a shutout. Now, Houston did step up in class, obviously, against Oklahoma this past week, but managing just 12 points, maybe there is something to suggest. They say that very often, especially with a new coach, teams make their greatest adjustment, their greatest improvement between games one and two. Now, that's hard to tell about Houston because of the fact that they stepped way up in class and going yeah. from UNLV to Oklahoma, but that's not slighting yeah. UNLV at all. UNLV had a, basically a scrimmage, 70, what was it, 77-14 against uh, Utah Tech. Um Considering the fact that Kansas put up some decent numbers, but they were hurt by turnovers last week and they lost outright to Illinois, I think we're going to see a very spirited effort from Kansas uh, in this game. And, you know, we'll talk about what the line move might be uh, perhaps a little bit later. Uh, had Kansas won last week, I might have been more inclined. I probably still would have oh, yeah. forecast the line at 10, but I might have a different opinion on the game this week. Yeah, I, I would have probably been more like you. I would have probably been right around 10 uh, if uh, they had won the game. All right, Texas A&M and Florida. So, uh, yep, early big one again for Napier. I don't think it's going to go well for him, though. Uh, Texas A&M had that big matchup week one against Notre Dame, and the offense just could not get on track. Uh, but we know that overall they're still a talented team with a new coach. I still think they're going to have an excellent season. And I'd be very surprised if they lost this football game. And I go into the line uh, part, and, and and I have to look at – this is one of the things I do look at once we get into the season is I, I do recall other lines and matchups. So I say to myself, well, Miami was about the same favorite number just you know a couple of weeks ago. So how does Texas A&M – what do I think Vegas is going to do in that spot considering what they have at the line with Miami? And now here comes Texas A&M. And that's pretty much why I had Texas A&M. A little bit more as a favorite. They're a better. They're, they're better conference in Miami. I think they may be projected to be just as talented, if not more talented. So that's that was pretty much my thinking. Is that I had a reference point already from Miami. So I kind of felt that uh, maybe you know add a point because I think what Miami was three and a half or something like that or two and a half. Two and a um, half to three. 
yeah, so I, I figured another uh, point or two would, would be the right way to go. I, I actually was a little bit lower, but not much lower. I actually made a and a two-point road favorite. Uh, this is their first road game of the season. They did lose at home to a Notre Dame team. and I'm, I, Okay, yeah, Notre Dame had the biggest upset. What will probably be the biggest upset of the season last week against Northern Illinois. I can't really say Notre Dame was looking ahead. I don't believe a lot. I don't believe all that much in look-ahead games, certainly not in the NFL and to a lesser extent in colleges. They do play at Purdue. Uh, this week, and I don't oh, think yeah. that's enough no. to, uh, uh, you know, it'd be one thing if they lost the game 36-34, but to lose the game was such a low-scoring game the way that they did, uh, that just uh, exposed some issues that Notre Dame may have to uh, uh, deal with. Uh, well, well uh, I thought that was more of we we, we prepared all season, all, you know, all camp to get ready for this major matchup because we also talked about the fact that Notre Dame's schedule yeah. is not all, that, not all that tough. So if they can get this win, it would be like a steal that they could afford another loss the rest of the season and have on their resume. Hey, we went to an SEC team and beat them, and we only have one loss. So, hey, and that's and so I think that was maybe more than anything, not a look ahead, but a you know, let down. A, Yes, that that what, I, that I do believe in in both the colleges and the pros, especially in the colleges. Notre Dame knew it was going to be in for a tough game. It was a tough game. They they won it in the fourth quarter, and maybe they just relaxed a little bit too much. Maybe they saw that they were 28, 29 point favorites northern over Northern Illinois, and just had to uh, show up. And you know that Northern Illinois. This was their game of the year. It's more important than any conference game they were going to play in. Don't think they expected to go in there and win, but they gave a a, a great effort. So uh, I'm not going to take anything away from a and because Notre Dame went on to lose the next week, but they are taking to the road. Florida beat up, a, you know, they played bully last week against a lesser opponent. Uh, still concerned about what they were unable to do against Miami. So I made the line a little bit short because, well, I'll just talk about this one as far as the potential line moves because I'm not sure which way the game could could move here from four and a half. It might move down if the people believe that, okay, we'll excuse Florida's effort against Miami because Miami is a real good team. Or they might say, you know what, uh, Florida is, is you know, they, the bad effort that they have against Miami suggests that four and a half is too much. But now they're looking at saying maybe I'll take A&M. But then again, how does, how does the uh, betting public interpret A&M's Lost to Notre Dame, given what Notre Dame the following week. So maybe, maybe now that I think in retrospect, maybe the best number for this game was just line of the three. All right, and then West Virginia Pitt, the backyard brawl. Nice to see these uh, rivalries uh, in college football uh, when you're trying to match up out of conference. And West Virginia, of course, had that uh, disappointing performance against Penn State uh, to open up the season. Pitt, meanwhile. Uh, matter of fact, I, I mentioned this with Mark last week because we didn't. We, we both agreed. We've kind of felt Pitt was gonna, uh, you know, after what we've seen from them lately, and you know, Narduzzi's Narduzzi's been there a while, and I don't know. It, it might be time. Maybe after this year, a bad year, it just might be time. But he made a great hire on the offensive side, and that has really helped the program tremendously. It's also helped. Uh, uh, with the fact that, that the coach brought one of his kids with him, that kid Reed, who's a fantastic player, and what a comeback. And they've got that Alabama transfer quarterback who's a little interception prone, but he's still a lot better than anything they've had the last couple of years. So uh, really exciting uh, to see what Pittsburgh's done so far this season. Uh, West Virginia's just more talented, though. So as far as the line was concerned, I was giving Pitt enough respect like they would, like they should. But I just felt that West Virginia had to be favored because they are just a more talented team, even if it was on the road. Yeah, I actually interpreted the Pittsburgh game a little bit differently. I mean, they had a little basically a walkthrough against uh, Kent State in the opening game of the season. But I liked what I saw last week when they fell behind big time uh, at Cincinnati and came all the way back to win that game. That's a confidence building uh, uh, game against a uh, a program comparable to a West Virginia in Cincinnati more than a, uh, a win over Kent the week before. So I actually opened uh, uh, Pittsburgh about a three point favorite in that game. Uh, you mentioned a lot of the reasons with some of the talent. And again, I'll go back to what I said before that often when you have a lot of new players coming in, in addition to a new coach, but in this case, new players, 
you don't know what you have until you see him in week one. You make some adjustments, and then uh, you tailor more of the game plan to what he can do and take and tailor it away from what he can't do in week two. And despite the sluggish start, uh, Pittsburgh had to gain a lot of uh, momentum in that game. So this will be an interesting one, and maybe we'll get a chance to talk about it, about where we think the line will go in this. I, you know, If I had to take a look at the, your opening line, Versus my opening line now, I probably would, I, I could certainly agree with your opening line a little bit more than mine. All right. Now, uh, we're not going to talk about all of these close ones. Just two of them I want to talk about, and that's the Indiana and Oklahoma lines. And, of course, Indiana, who would have thought about this, uh, that Indiana would be taken on UCLA and they would be the favorites on the In road. In a conference game, much less. Now it's a conference game, too. So uh, for UCLA, we know that they've got some coaching deficiencies as, as far as their head coach. who doesn't have a lot of experience, whereas, uh, you know, you've got a, a Indiana team that has a hell of a, a, a new coach that they're just really excited about. And they've got that quarterback from Ohio and they're off to a really fun start. So I looked at the line and um, and you know what, maybe it'll end up at three. I don't know. But the fact is, is that's kind of where I put it, uh, because I just thought that yeah, you know what? Indiana is a better team than UCLA, uh, but I couldn't make them too much of a favorite because it was on the road. Uh, and uh, it's not like UCLA has done anything wrong yet. So, um, yeah, I was pretty happy with the line. And uh, I wonder if it will move uh, to three or whether or not anybody will jump on UCLA. Well, I actually made UCLA a very slight favorite in that game. They got uh, their all they wanted with their scare in Hawaii to open the season. But then they had the week off to get ready for their first game ever against the conference foe. And they're hosting an Indiana team that I like the coaching upgrade, but the coach isn't going to score any touchdowns or block any uh, uh, punts or anything like that. It's a, it's a decently talented team. I love the coach coming over from uh, James Madison, but um, – I think it was James Madison. Was I correct on that one? Uh, uh, yes, correct. Yeah. Um, that uh, um, there's still talent on UCLA. Yeah, they uh, they lost their defensive coordinator to uh, to USC, which will be a bit of a, of a loss. And of course, Chip Kelly is now sitting there in Ohio State with uh, Ryan Day as his offensive uh, as Chip Kelly, the offensive coordinator there. So uh, that uh, that will have something to do with Ohio State's performance this year. Uh, but this is a classic situation of. Now, UCLA being a home underdog, uh, despite the fact that Indiana had to travel all the way across the country. I think the last time that they played in the th Rose Bowl. And you thought that's why you thought the opposite? You thought UCLA yeah, I thought UCLA would be a very slight favorite, mainly because of the week off where they had a chance to work on some things that didn't work against Hawaii. And the fact that uh, it's UCLA's first game as a member of the Pac-10. 10 uh, the big 10 and they're at home and the fact again that they had the week off and um that in that indiana's first two games against what you arguably would say i'll, I'll say lesser opponents certainly lesser talent opponents than the, than the, the ucla has and that they that those two games were at home so they're going to get a big test playing i well ucla doesn't get a huge crowd except when the rose bowl no. is in town and they're participating oh, oh, what about movement then what do you think you think there will be some oh okay you want to talk about that one i i you know, at two and a half, there's always the thought that, and maybe this, and again, I try to not to read too much into lines makers setting movements, setting lines, expecting movements, but I could understand, given Indiana and the hype around the coach and the Big Ten pedigree, that the lines makers set the line at two and a half because maybe they think UCLA is the right side, expecting the line to go from two and a half to three. Yeah, okay. okay. As opposed to, as opposed to if they open the line UCLA two and a half, then they might think the money will come on UCLA to push it to three, and they really expect Indiana to give a showing there. That's that's just some hypothesis on my on on my part, but certainly at three, I haven't done it yet. But uh, if the line does go to three, um, almost certain to be on UCLA. All right, and then the other game uh, before we move on uh, is Oklahoma. And they're playing Tulane, and the number being, you know, about uh, 14 there. Uh, so, yeah, I thought that after what we saw from Tulane in their in their game against another Big 12, well, they're still Big 12 teams in my mind, but Oklahoma, uh, that Tulane was going to get some respect. And uh, I don't know what this line would have been before that, maybe 17, something like that. But I, I figured they deserved a few more points. And so I dropped it to about 14. 
the, the young quarterback for Tulane looks like they've got a really good one. So they're in great hands there. Tulane looks like they're going to be still a solid football program moving forward uh, post Fritz. For Oklahoma, though, yeah, I mean, if they blow out Houston like a lot of people thought, then that's where, yeah, you know what, maybe they should be 16, 17. But I wouldn't even be surprised if this line drops, to tell you the truth. I uh, made the line 16, and uh, that was less okay. than I would have expected them to if they had handled Houston as I expected them to. I don't believe I bet on Oklahoma. I probably preferred them last week against Houston, but um, I, I didn't make a play on them. Uh, the concern I have for Oklahoma is that if they were going to have a letdown or a sloppy game, it would have been this week against Tulane because they have their first SEC game next week hosting the Tennessee Volunteers. And so if Ooh. they were going to just go through the motions and uh, – uh, just say, let's do enough to win. Let's give our, our backup some time to play because we may need them next week against the Vols, uh, that it would have been this week. So, because uh, I can't believe Houston was, uh, Oklahoma was bypassing Houston, even though they may have said, know. look what Houston did against UNLV, nothing. We can beat this team by just showing up and, you know, maybe give our backups a little bit more experience. So not quite sure what to do uh, with this game. It's almost it's almost a similar similar situation to uh, what Florida State has to overcome. Now, of course, Oklahoma's won their two games. They beat a really bad Temple team, I think, about 42-7 to seven or something. And then they struggled mightily against a weak Houston team that obviously is better than Temple. But, you know, how much better, we're not uh, really sure. But if I'm looking at a team to bounce back uh, like, uh, like I do with a Florida State where the line is only seven, I don't feel comfortable laying double digits with uh, Oklahoma. Not quite sure to, to know what to make of Tulane, especially since Fritz was such a good coach building up that Tulane program. And apparently they didn't really miss him last week with what they had. But of course, you know, new, new players coming in. So I wouldn't be surprised if this line does come down largely based on the fact that how bad Oklahoma looked against um, uh, 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 Tulane last week. Houston, uh, yeah. excuse, excuse me. Um, uh, Memphis, uh, um, Houston. Houston last week, and the fact that they've got Tennessee on deck. The situation says we need a big effort out of Oklahoma if they have to have any confidence going in against Tennessee. Yeah. But, you know, the the emotional, mental aspect might just be that, you know, let's uh, – Let's 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 stay healthy for the game that counts next week against uh, against Tennessee and just do enough to win. All right, and then the ones that uh, I just by, by the way, it's to... kind of, it's, it's almost kind of like the game. It's a little bit different. Oregon against Boise last week after a flat effort by Oregon the week before against Idaho, they got a fight from uh, a Boise State knowing that Oregon State was on deck. So we'll see what happens with uh, Oklahoma knowing Tennessee's on deck. And as far as uh, the ones uh, that I'm just going to pick, uh, pick out of the way off, um, one of them is, is, the, is the one that I was complete. I mean, wow. I mean, I, I actually thought I, I've seen, and I, I know Chris Creighton a lot. Of course, he, he's a handicapper's dream as a dog. And, and this is not a dog spot, but you still have to give them respect for the way that they've started the season and so, I, especially last week, I know they didn't uh, win the game, but they covered again, and it was fairly competitive for a team like Eastern Michigan talent-wise against a team like Washington. And Jacksonville State has done nothing this year, zero. And yet, so I thought Eastern Michigan was going to be a two-touchdown favorite. I, I had no problem. And I know Eastern Michigan is not the type of school you want to be. They're not usually two-touchdown favorites. I get that. But I was just shocked that the line was two. I mean, I don't know. Quarterback out for the year, did I miss something? I mean, did you think it was going to be two or three points? No, I uh, thought that uh, Jacksonville State, uh, I'm sure that Eastern Michigan would have been about eight. Okay. Uh, just based upon the decline that we've seen out of uh, Jacksonville State. Now, admittedly, I was, I was, I was very disappointed because I like Jacksonville State on that Thursday night opener in front of the home crowd against Coastal Carolina, uh, but uh, they were never in that game. No. And, of course, they really stepped up in class against Louisville. Uh, they did have, they do have a lot to rebuild. You know, if you look at Mark Lawrence's uh, you know playbook, five offensive starters returning, six defensive oh, starters yeah. returning. So Absolutely. I can understand uh, that they uh, that they lost a, a lot. Probably um, at at two, 
I might be inclined to play Eastern Michigan, but I also have to believe that this line being as short as it is, I mean, you are talking about, uh, you know, a, a couple of power five conference, uh, a group of five conference teams. That I'll probably stay away from it. It looks a little bit easier to say, well, Jacksonville State has really shown nothing. They're probably a more talented team overall than Eastern Michigan. But why is Eastern Michigan just a very, very short favorite? despite the fact that Jacksonville State has looked so bad their first two games. All right, so th- is this one of those games then that you're like, this is almost, this is, seems too easy. There's something, there's something going on there. There's something going on that I'm not, I'm not totally focusing yeah. on here. That, yeah, it seems like this, that Eastern Michigan, you see, if Eastern Michigan would have been a four-point favorite, I'd feel a little bit more comfortable about that opening <laughs> line because That's now cool. you're looking at, do I want to take the dog plus three? I don't know that anyone wants to take Jacksonville State uh, plus two in this game, but well, why would you even want to take Jacksonville State? I mean, who the because, hell would want to do that? Because the line is so because the line is so low. Yeah, but it, that would be one of those things where, well, I'm just staying away from the game. Well, that's probably what I'm going to do. But yeah. my first inclination would be when when I see a line that doesn't make sense to me, and this one doesn't. Uh, my first, uh, it's almost like the UCLA Indiana game. You know, they wanted to open the game, pick them. I'd say. Okay, they're basically saying on a neutral field, Indiana's a three-point better, three to four-point better team. Okay, I can buy that. But to have Indiana two-and-a-half to three-point favorite and say that they're a touchdown better on a neutral field, I'm not quite sure about that. Now, a lot of people are aware, like we said, about the Indiana coaching change, but that still doesn't – I still don't know that that justifies that line there. With Eastern Michigan, it's a little bit different because uh, um, they have shown that they can be competitive in, in their game so far. All right, and then uh, the only other one that I was like way off on that I just uh, because we're talking again, favorite to dog, dog to favorite was Sam Houston State, and uh, that was uh, one of my double digit upset plays in Week One against Rice. So I'm just putting it out there because I respect Sam Houston State. I, I you know I think this is going to be a good year for Sam Houston State. It woke up last week, and I figured that wake up last week, and now this week. Uh, they come back to playing a, uh, a much uh, easier opponent, obviously, in Hawaii. Um, and they get them at home. So they get some advantages that Hawaii's got to come to the mainland. Uh, so these are all advantages before I was deciding who to pick. But and, and look, I'm not trying to make UCLA out to anything. But let's just use them as a reference. So Indiana is a two point three point favorite against UCLA. Hawaii led UCLA until the last minute of the game, or they would have won 2-0. Uh, they've got a they, – they had a really good hire uh, on the defensive side, defensive coach, uh, pro experience. Uh, they've got a, a reasonable a number of guys back. And I just figured, well, we're still talking about a Mountain West Conference team where the coach has been there a while now and a team that looks like they're – Better than last year. That Timmy Chang is going to get the, is getting him better and better. And I just figured, you know what, Houston should be uh, Hawaii should be the favorite in this game. I'm going to go ahead and put him as a seven point favorite. And I was completely floored that San Jose, San, Sam Houston State ends up as a four and a half point favorite. Well, I, I wonder if that Hawaii game. I'm sort of contradicting myself here. That Hawaii game against UCLA said more about UCLA than it did about. Hawaii, but again, UCLA's now had the time off to uh, re- remedy at least as much as they can can uh, against uh, Indiana and what's prices. Well, again, they're only game. a two and a half point dog against Indiana. Yeah, and look uh, at that's what I'm saying. That the fact that they're an underdog, I think, suggests that there was a reaction more ne- more ne- more of a negative reaction to UCLA and their effort against Hawaii than a positive uh, reaction to Hawaii, even though that's probably. Uh, deserved. When I now look at Sam Houston, two things that I do like about Sam Houston. I actually made Sam Houston a three-point favorite in this game. Now, Hawaii has had uh, the week off. This is their first trip to the mainland. And at the same time, uh, Sam Houston is now um, uh, back home or playing, I believe it's their first home game. Yeah, it's a home opener. Yeah, they had that Rice game, and then uh, uh, they got blown out last week. Um, Let me check here for a moment. Yeah, they got blown out by Central Central Florida. Florida. A very good Central Florida team. Uh, so uh, I can justify Sam Houston being favored. And I'm more inclined to play uh, Sam Houston as a favorite in this game, knowing that they were all ready to win a, a game on the road at Rice. And you know, is Rice much better or weaker than Hawaii or pretty close to the same? I'd say probably pretty Rice close to the same. Rice is a little bit better. 
or at least it should be. Well, the only thing with Rice is they have such a small student body to draw from. I think they may be the lowest. Well, they've been, they were at a ball. They had a good season yeah. last season, and but they're not as good as they were last year. Well, they're a smart team, and they don't make mistakes for the, to a large extent. And that, uh, you know, you give up extra possessions by turning the ball over, that's going to ultimately, you know, hurt you in the end. So I, uh, I will probably go with Sam Houston. I did have Sam Houston against Rice. I did expect a better effort against uh, Central Florida, but Central Florida has a history of being a very strong team, and this year's addition seems to be right along those lines. So I'll sort of excuse that, but now they're home in front of the home folks, and uh, Hawaii is certainly a beatable opponent. Well, look, we're going to find out whether or not Hawaii is actually better this season. uh, Remember, they struggled with Delaware State in that opening game where they were like a 40-point favorite. Yeah, well, that's, you know. That's the game you're supposed to win, 40 to nothing. Well, sure. Uh, But, you know, they did win it, and they almost beat UCLA. But I guess we'll find out if they're just the same old Hawaii. Uh, Because if they lose this game, then that might be saying, yeah, they're just Hawaii. They go to the mainlands. You shouldn't take them. Uh, All right. So uh, the NFL, and uh, we'll we'll, we'll just uh, go through these. So, again, the top three there that I was correct at, and there's the four that I was really close at by just a half. Uh, As far as those games up top, uh, sort of like we'd see with college. So some of the sevens and in the in college, see some of the three. So it was a little bit easier to get to, to make predictions correct on. Um, and yeah, as far as Dallas is concerned, uh, you know, you really, you do wonder uh, about as far as this line was concerned, but it, and even Dallas is the team. I kind of felt that um, they were going to get the benefit of the doubt because Dallas seems to, I don't know what your experience is, but it just seems that Dallas winds up, uh, getting a little bit uh, more, uh, uh, you know, action as far as the lines are concerned because they're Dallas. Um, and I know there, there, there's, uh, even though there's a lot of people that would love to bet against them, but I just get the feeling that Dallas gets a little bit more respect when they're playing well, and they are. And obviously Mike McCarthy isn't uh, starting really well. But this New Orleans Saint team, yeah, they blow out Carolina, but I, I couldn't imagine Dallas was going to be favored by more than seven considering how well New Orleans played in week one. So I think this was about where I thought they were going to be, somewhere around six and a half or seven. Yeah, I actually uh, made the line six, figuring we'd get some money in on Dallas anyway, because I can't take all that much out of the New Orleans win over uh, um, over Carolina. How is it for Carolina? Two and fifteen last year should be better this year. And what happens to Bryce Young? First pass oh, intercepted. I mean, terrible. and that set the tone. Maybe not just for the game, but uh, for the season. Um, as for Dallas. First of all, they were a very happy team yesterday with all the contract extensions that they had, and the one with Dak um, uh, publicized after the, uh, or you know, right before the start of the game after Saturday night. Uh, so they were a happy bunch of uh, Cowboys after uh, being sort a of a little yeah. unhappy during the season. They went out and they really took advantage of a Cleveland team that, well, Deshaun Watson has, you know, regressed. Now maybe you know, I heard today that there's another sexual assault lawsuit against him and maybe he was aware of that either yesterday or that it was pending well, or something now, you know, you but, know we talked about this andy what, what the problem was and you saw it in the game is cleveland's offensive line situation is yeah is, it was the worry because not only did they lose their their awesome coach but they, they've had a lot of injuries banged and no up Nick injuries in camp well yes overcome. no question about that but yeah. uh, the offensive line just has not gelled in the preseason and uh, there was a lot of worry and concern about not only does their coach gone, but generally the, the, the talent that's there has just not been able to play together. They hadn't played together the entire preseason. So that was a legitimate Which, By the way, I think concern. some coaches will learn from next year. Don't keep your t- starters entirely out of preseason. We've seen that with a well, number yeah, of you, if, Yes, if, if you had the Give right to, yes. Yeah. yeah, Cleveland had some guys that were banged up. There was nothing they could do about it. So, look, I don't think that's going away for Cleveland. I think this is something until they start playing more together and remain healthy, this might go on for another month for Cleveland. But, yeah, that's why I think is – I'm not trying to take any credit away from Dallas, um, but just there's a, there's a reason why Cleveland looked as bad as they did. Well, not only that, and, of course, part of it does have to do with uh, Cleveland's ineptness, but the defense looked very good, and that's been a strength of the last few years. I mean, Micah Parsons always in the conversation for defensive uh, player of the year, and they've got a good unit uh, around him. Um, The story with uh, Dallas, of course, is uh, Dak Prescott takes him to the playoffs, and Mike McCarthy coaches him out of the playoffs, but uh, that's a long way down the road. This is still a very talented Dallas team. Don't think they're the best team in the division. I give that nod to uh, uh, Philadelphia. But I think the line makes sense. 
New Orleans, uh, you know, one of the things I always have, and I mention it, you know, uh, don't take too much out of uh, the last game. And when two bad teams play, one bad team has to win. When two good teams play, one good team has to lose. So you don't want to overreact when one bad team wins or when one good team loses. I'm not saying that New Orleans beating Carolina is one bad team beating another bad team. I think New Orleans is a mediocre team, mediocre team beating a yeah. really bad team. But they did get a lot of confidence out of that. I think guys like Kamara played a little bit better than he had shown uh, the last few years. So maybe he's got something left in the tank. Uh, not the greatest of uh, coaching matchups between McCarthy and uh, uh, Dennis Allen. Um, I, I think well, the line makes sense. Um, this looks like it's going to be a good game to tease the Dallas Cowboys. All right. Uh, it's not a bad idea. Uh, meanwhile, as far as Indianapolis, this took me two seconds to make this prediction uh, because, and I haven't heard anything yet in the last 24 hours, but look, I said this around the draft a couple of years ago. What uh, in the world is this infatuation with Malik Willis? This guy is not an NFL quarterback. He's never going to be an NFL quarterback. And I can't believe they were stupid enough to make a trade like that and to put themselves in this vulnerable situation by having that guy as the number two. Now, again, I have no idea what their plans are this week, but the line for me was so easy because I knew Indianapolis was going to be favorite. I knew they couldn't be favored by more than three, but I don't, again, yeah, th this was easy. Indianapolis is definitely not going to lose to Green Bay if Willis is their quarterback. So I figured three was an easy one. Yeah, because uh, I would have thought the other way around if uh, Love hadn't been injured that the uh, Packers would be a three to five point, three or four point favorite. In yeah. This, uh, in maybe, this matchup. maybe larger. Yeah. Possibly, although Indianapolis, you know, Indianapolis, the game between, I started about, you know, two good teams play each other, one team has to win, one team has to lose. Well, Indianapolis and Houston is a perfect example. I thought both teams played pretty much well in that game and it went down, you know, every, every time one team scored, it seemed like the other team was able to, uh, uh, to, uh, to match it. So I take nothing away from Indianapolis for losing, maybe give a little bit of credit to Houston for winning on the road against a division rival, which is always uh, uh, a plus uh, thing to do, especially when it's a competitively priced game as uh, this one was. Um, I, when when the injury came out, I also had Indianapolis about a one and a half to a two point favorite. I wasn't quite sure what they were going to do. I know Malik Willis uh, is not a very solid quarterback; doesn't have a lot of experience. But the I, so I like you're, you're being kind. Yeah, I, I like Lafleur as a coach. I like the fact that they do have a little bit extra time to get ready, and you know uh, the running game is decent enough. Yeah, the quarterback, they're going to have to do a lot of protection and not ask uh, Willis to do too much in that game. Uh, coming off of that loss to Philadelphia, which, again, is an explainable loss that they had their opportunity. I don't know that Love would have been able to complete a Hail Mary at the end of the game if he didn't get well, injured on that yeah. third play before the end. So mm -hmm. it was basically, you know, it was basically a, a game that could have gone in that, that did go either way. It was expected to go either way. So, um you know, this is the kind of situation. I'll be interested to see where where Mark will be on this game because he likes situations like this, even with the injury issue, the quarterback issue of taking home dogs. Saying that is, I've always maintained that the adjustment for a loss of quarterbacks is more than just two or three points, but this one might be factored in as about a seven point difference. It'd be a lot different uh, than if uh, uh, Willis had to come in in the middle of the game last week and showed poorly and didn't show any improvement. We don't know what's going to happen this week. Oh, I do. Uh, but I can. I'll be interested to see where this line, uh, this line goes. Yeah. Well, we can start with that because we're out of time. So let's go ahead into the big line movements. So talk about. Um, g give me, uh, uh, you know, a college and an NFL uh, line. Uh, it doesn't even have necessarily have to be on these games, but you can pick uh, a game each on, on this one if you want. Uh, which ones are you going to be looking at, or, or you think that the viewers should be taking advantage of based on what your feelings are on, on what kind of line, line movement, significant line movement we might see? I think we might see some movement in that Kansas game I talked about earlier. Now, I haven't looked at the at the odds board in the last couple of hours, but Kansas was pretty much a seven-point favorite in their uh, Friday night game hosting uh, UNLV. First of all, these teams know each other having met in the bowl game last year. And given what we've seen out of UNLV, 
uh, the first two games, especially with a new quarterback in there, Kansas, I think, will be very well prepared. I, I like Leipold as a coach. I like them ever since he came over from Buffalo. So I think we will see some support for Kansas. At some point, there'll be a buyback on UNLV, but maybe it doesn't come until the line goes to eight and a half or nine. So I think okay. that's one where I'll see the line move. As far as the uh, uh, the NFL goes, um, I wouldn't be surprised to see, uh, I think, what was Washington, a two-and-a-half-point favorite over the uh, Giants. And the Giants yeah. looked totally bad. I heard uh, from a friend of mine who had a, had a close acquaintance at the game that at, uh, at the Met uh, uh, Sunday, fans were leaving in the third quarter of that game to go stand in the players' parking lot so they could boot Daniel Jones on his way out of the stadium. That's how bad things were, and that's how fed up fans were. I liked what I saw of Daniels last week in, in the game against Tampa Bay, which was very difficult. It's always difficult for a, uh, uh, a rookie quarterback to win a game and win his first game, especially when it's on the road, which is kind of interesting because it also brings me to the uh, Houston game hosting Chicago. If ever there was a rookie quarterback in a position to win their first game, it's a playing at home and B it's given the talent that the bears have been able to surround Caleb Williams uh, with, and they managed to come back and win that game without an offensive touchdown in that yeah. game to come back. Both, against, both rookie uh, quarterbacks looked awful. And, well, Tennessee. Um, Bo Nix didn't look too bad up in uh, up in Seattle. No, I said both the the oh. top two guys. They look. Oh, the awful. top two guys. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you think this Washington line? Then you're saying that you think it's going to move up. I think the, I think Washington will be a three point favorite. And oh, I, just a half a point. Um. Yeah. So, the three so that, will that, be. So there's no games in the NFL this week that you're confident or you're looking at that you think could have a significant move. Well, a significant. Uh, I consider uh, two and a half to three as a significant move. I might consider what we'll see in the in the Denver game. I actually. Oh, right. So you I think actually, Washington is going to be going to bump up two and a half more? Well, where, where, where are they at now? Two and a half. They, no, I think they're going to move up to three. Oh. And okay. then no, I thought you said that. Uh, I said no. Okay. When I say significant move, it's because of the number. Yeah, so let's yeah. Talk, so let's try to get one that you do think might be. So you're saying a significant move in the NFL. You have seen it uh, on average, where you can get a line movement of about two to three points in one week. Yeah, I'm trying to think what game that that. Uh, and might... by the way, where where do you yeah. see most of the movement? Do you see most of the movement slowly on average or on game day? It varies. There are some games where there's early movement in the week and you wonder if there's going to be buyback later in the week and there isn't or there's very minimal. And then there's other games that sit there a solid number throughout the week and then the late move comes in. I mean, we saw it, for example, and I know it was injury related to, to a certain extent. And that was the game between the Patriots and the Bengals where the Bengals went down to as low. I think they may have been seven in some places, certainly seven and a half when the news came out that uh, uh, Chase was going to see limited action, although he did catch six passes in the game, and Higgins was definitely uh, ruled out. So there's a situation where you saw some late move, which was not uh, unexpected. We saw some move throughout the week on the San Francisco game, but a lot of that had to do with uh, uh, Trent Williams signing back on Monday. That line, which opened six over the summer before training camp, had gone as low as um, three and a half. On Monday, and then when Williams signed, it went up back up to four, four and a half, which was a significant but understandable uh, move upwards. If I'm going to look at uh, uh, a significant move this week, uh, uh, let, let me let me tell. How about the? Because this is one. I don't know if you were, but I was pretty surprised that uh, Arizona is a favorite, even though it's only one over the Rams. So can you see that moving over to the Rams? Well, I think it opened partially because of the uh, wide receiver injury that the Rams suffered Sunday night. Uh, so I think he's on the uh, IR right now for uh, an extended period of time. Uh, Arizona. So, so can played you see it where where then logic might start to creep in as we get closer to the game? Like initial impact of Nakua not being available to. Yeah, wait a second. Not not have had time to think about it this week. Why is Arizona favored over the Rams? Uh, well, yeah, I think that that's part of it, that it may be that the Rams lost uh, one of their uh, receivers and the uh, uh, Detroit, you know, had success moving the ball. We didn't we, I don't know that we really saw that much of an impact of uh, well, who, uh, I mean, of Aaron Donald. I, I, the Rams are better than Arizona, though. I mean, that's pretty much I mean, that yeah. doesn't mean that that's going to be the case. But I think most people believe that the Rams are a better team than Arizona. So, well, the thought um, I have there is that Arizona 
played well in their loss to Buffalo. And okay. Arizona was also one of the teams that over the summer a lot of people thought would be improved. Now, of okay. course, uh, Kyler Murray missed that wide open Marvin Harrison late in the game. He had only one catch and that one had one that wide open one that he didn't spot him on might have been a game winning touchdown. And then if all of a sudden Arizona beats Buffalo, uh, which they came close to doing and led for you know a decent part of that game, you know, maybe this line does open Arizona even a little bit higher. But okay. I could see the on, on reputation, I could see the Rams moving too big, maybe a one to a one and a half to two point favorite in that game. I'm trying to think of a game right now. I want to see what the reaction is to Seattle's win over Denver. They're a three point favorite. I thought they might open five over New England. But again, we still have that unknown factor about the Patriots that came into play. Maybe it had more to do with Cincinnati. You know, they had that fumble in the end zone and all that. We might see Baltimore go up to 10 or 10 and a half coming off of that, uh, that, um, with that loss, that close loss at Kansas City that came down to a toenail, basically, in that one. They've had the extra time off. The Raiders, the quarterback issues and the offensive line issues that we thought we would see against the Chargers, uh, we did see. The defense played reasonably well. Um, but yeah, I, could I think see, that, yeah, that quarterback situation, I think, was definitely I, I could the see biggest Baltimore effect. Yeah, I could see, but you know, Baltimore moved the ball against Kansas City, they, they put up some gaudy numbers in that game. But again, it's no shame losing to the defending two time defending Super Bowl champs uh, on the uh, on the road. So I think we're going to I think Baltimore. Well, the number tells you Baltimore's going to be Raiders a pretty good. Uh, aren't they uh, usually good or have been good in this spot as a dog? Uh, I don't know if it's a dog on the East Coast or just a dog in general. You know, I haven't really I haven't really looked into that right now. That's sort of where yeah. I'm, I'm 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 I think doing some of my memory. Uh, yeah. Uh, well the only that's thing why the I only was th- a little bit surprised yeah. to see it ten myself. Well see the only thing I actually had it opening eight and a half. Um so I wasn't that uh, you know, that far off from, from where it opened. But I think a lot of it was the reaction to Baltimore having the extra time, Baltimore being the perennial playoff team, et cetera. And, what about uh, Detroit? Because I, I was uh, kind of surprised. I mean, you know, uh, they had the tough one with Tampa. I mean, with the with the Rams. Yeah. They played the Rams in Tampa last year to open up the playoffs. Both games were very tough. Tampa was very tough in that second yeah. week, second round playoff game. Tampa comes out. And says to everybody, you keep disrespecting us and we just keep shoving it back in your face. You know, I'm a different Baker Mayfield. You know, we're, we're, we're just a different team. Or at least that's what they're saying. And, and, I, and I believe it. And it, here's a line of complete disrespect. The Rams will get four and a half point dog. And Tampa comes into the town at seven. So that's why I, I had it at four and a half. I figured, well, you had the Rams at four and a half. Why wouldn't Tampa Bay be four and a half? And by the way, you also have the Rams as a three-point dog against Arizona. So I'm a little – that's showing a lot of disrespect for Tampa Bay. Well, a lot of it has to do, again, with the with perhaps a little bit of an overreaction. I don't know exactly what the number was on the advance sheet for this game before the game was played because that would, uh, if I had that in front of me right now, I'd be able to make a uh, – It was four. More. Uh, no, it was uh, six and a half. It was the same line, basically. Oh, okay. Uh, on the advance line from the Westgate from uh, – Ten days ago, from a, well, actually a week ago. Oh, okay, no, 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 the book. Or oh, you're talking about the over the summer line. Yeah, yeah. Well, it shouldn't it shouldn't have been that much different actually because you you just had that one game in between. Uh, a lot of people do use that line of thinking, and very often they can spot some things. And you may may be very well right about both the Rams and Tampa Bay. Now they did play in the regular season last year, and I think the Lions won that game. I want to say thirty-four to twenty or thirty-one to twenty or yeah, something they, like yeah, that. Yeah, they and beat them up in Tampa. The, yeah, and then they play, and then they played in the uh, playoffs, as you mentioned. I think that number is probably solid. I, I could see some some movement on Detroit because again Detroit is one of those fashionable picks to win the Super Bowl. They've made improvement in the last each of the last three years, and you know they played well. Although I hate you mean that over more than rule. seven. Uh, you mean as far as it going up a little bit? Well, you just said you could see Detroit you, you getting action on this. Yeah, maybe seven and a half. At, at wow. what point okay. at, will Tampa Bay come back? I mean, Tampa Bay was favored over Washington, and they were going against a uh, a rookie quarterback on a bad team. Uh, so uh, I could understand uh, Tampa Bay. That was actually well my biggest did. one last week. I had Tampa, Tampa Bay as a six and a half point favorite. A lot of, a lot of people had them in the uh, in in the betting this week. That Tampa Bay was a very popular play, both in the. Uh, survivor and in the uh, point spread uh, action on the board as well. So right okay. now I don't see much of a huge move 
in the NFL, but the NFL generally okay. doesn't move uh, that significantly from week to week. All right. So uh, that'll wrap it up. And again, next week, uh, we're going to basically, we're going to condense this up and we're going to be able to just grab a few games from both Andy's card and my card. We'll show you everything. Uh, so you can see what, what we're looking at on both uh, what Andy's uh, uh, picks are coming into the show, what mine were coming into the show, and then we're just going to break them down. Uh, so we'll go over a much uh, more condensed uh, uh, part of the schedule. But, you know, it's our first show, so we wanted to be able to kind of go in depth with introducing Andy to the channel. Uh, so you have a little bit of an idea of uh, who Andy is, where he comes from. Of course, you can check Andy out uh, tomorrow on the playbook experts youtube channel so that should be available uh, after recording sometime in the early evening that'll be wednesday evening uh, of this week sometimes we're not able to get it posted until thursday morning but hopefully it'll be available to you guys on wednesday evening and then uh, before i let you go andy what else uh, should the uh viewers uh, know about uh what they can do as you mentioned the newsletter so how can they acquire that well, they can go visit the uh, logicalapproach.com website and take a look. I've got some samples up from uh, uh, last year. And in fact, if uh, someone wants to get uh, a copy of this week's newsletter, let me give the uh, email address out and uh, I can send the copy. Well, of this and I'll have a out. link in the description of this video as well. Okay. Uh, logical7 at cox.net. That's C-O-X dot N-E-T. Logical, L-O-G-I-C-A-L, the numeral 7 at cox.net. And just... Uh, Indicate that you uh, saw or heard us on uh, the out the uh, the Our Lads podcast for this week, the line the line prediction podcast, and I'll get one out to you uh, in the next day or so. Okay, so that one actually uh, is going to be uh, so I'm going to have a link in the description so you can go ahead and purchase and find out more about Logical Approach. But for this uh, uh, promo, oh, this one say, yeah, this one will be complimentary. This will no be complimentary, involved. and yeah. this will be again logical seven. Se the number seven or it's called out. Okay. No, no. Number, no, number seven, number. and that's at cox. Dot net. Yes, I would use the cool. reference as in Wally Cox or Archibald Cox, but that's way before the time, probably, of most of our viewers. Yeah, including me. All <laughs> right, so that's going to wrap it up. Again, Andy, I'll uh, see you on the show tomorrow with Mark Lawrence, and uh, we'll see it. everybody here again, or I'll see everybody here again on uh, the Our Lads Football Network on Thursday. When I speak with Mark and Mark and I take a look at the week's action in the NFL and college football. So Andy, appreciate it. Look forward to doing this rest of the season. Looking forward to it, Greg. Thank you.